Good morning and welcome to worship Maple United Methodist Church on this third Sunday of Lent, March the 20th, 2022. We're glad to have you join us this morning as we continue our look at the hands of those people involved in the final hours of Jesus' life here on this earth. We're glad to have you worshiping with us this day as we hear this greeting together. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor punish us according to our wickedness. What shall we render to the Lord for all his bounty to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Praise be to God, the Almighty. Let me remind you on this Holy Sabbath day that Christ knows all our thoughts. He has heard all of our prayers. He has ripped apart the barriers that separate us from God and has opened up to us the grace of God by his sacrifice of love on a cross and his resurrection from the dead. Christ has given us peace so that we may share it with our neighbors. I invite you today to share the peace of Christ that you have experienced with those whose lives come in contact with yours. As we come together for our time of prayer this week, once again, the whole situation in Middle Europe is on our hearts and minds. A situation that desperately needs peace. That needs a peaceful resolution so that lives are no longer lost, homes and families and cities are no longer destroyed, so that men and women Young people and children can live together in harmony and peace. I invite you to continue to be in prayer for the whole situation in Ukraine and Russia, that whole region of Europe. Please keep the people there in your prayers. We need also to remember in prayer those of our families, our friendships, our congregation that are dealing with recovery from surgery or illness, those that are facing yet difficult tests or questions about treatment. We need to be in prayer for those that are at this moment perhaps in hospice care, facing the end of their earthly life. And we need to be in prayer for our communities even as the turmoil in Europe increases, there's been no decrease in the turmoil in our cities. There's still a rise in crime, there's still a need for a serious police presence. People's lives and livelihoods are still in jeopardy, so let's pray for one another this day. I invite you as we approach our time of the message today dealing with the hands of judgment that we pray for those that are in positions of power, those who have the serious responsibility of passing judgment on others, of making decisions that will affect our lives and the lives of those around us. Let us pray this day. To you, O Lord, the Prince of Peace, we come this day, desperately seeking peace in our world. A peace that brings a sense of calm, a sense of serenity, a sense of mutual acceptance between nations and peoples and individuals. We pray for an end 
to the conflict, O oh Lord. For an end to the need for expansion or power. An end to the need for bullying others into following our position or believing the same way we do. We pray, O oh Lord, for the people of Ukraine that are being disrupted from their homes, their lives, their families. We pray for the women, the children, the elderly that are being forced to flee from the only homes they've ever known. To go to a place where they don't speak the language, they don't know the customs, they don't even know where they're going to sleep tonight. We pray for your comfort for those families. We pray for their, the men of those families that have remained behind to fight for their country, to fight for freedom, to fight for the right to live as they choose to live and not as the way someone else wants them to. Oh Lord, we pray for your security, for your guardian angels to surround those that are standing toe to toe against evil and seeking to bring a peaceful solution. We pray for those, oh Lord, in positions of power this day, in our cities, in our states, in our nation, indeed throughout our world. It is those in the position of power that, that need your guidance the most right now. To make the decisions necessary to somehow facilitate peace and unity in our world. Give wisdom this day. And guidance. And above all, oh Lord, we pray that you would grant us powerful sense of hope to those who are looking for answers. Be with our family members and friends that are facing difficult situations, dealing with illness, with disease, with unspeakable situations that we can't even begin to understand. We pray for peace in their lives, even as we pray for guidance and for your healing power to surround them. Be with the doctors, the nurses, the medical staff that are proposing solutions, that are seeking treatments, that are working with families to bring answers to their questions and healing to their lives. We pray, O oh Lord, for their continued strength as they've been in battle with this COVID crisis for far too long. They're exhausted. They need your help. They need your strength and your hope. Oh Lord, during this Lenten season, we pray for us that we might get a better handle on what really happened so long ago as our Lord Jesus faced the cross as his friends deserted him and betrayed him, as folks sat in judgment on him and crucified him, Lord, we pray that we might understand a little bit better what caused people to act like that. Because in reality, we're not that far different than they. Speak to us this day from your word from our time spent in your presence, that we might hear something that we need to hear, that we might be encouraged to make that decision that we need to make, that we might be led down that path you would have us to take. Speak to us this day, O oh Lord, of your presence. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who went to the cross for us and who taught us to pray together as brothers and sisters in the same family, as he taught us to pray, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we continue in our series dealing with the hands of those involved in the final hours of Jesus' life, Today our scripture comes from the 27th chapter of Matthew, dealing with Pontius Pilate, the governor, in Jerusalem. Reading first just the first two verses of chapter 27 and then moving over to verse 11 to continue the story. Remember now Jesus has already been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas has betrayed him. Peter has already denied him just outside in the temple courtyard. And now Jesus is brought before Pilate himself. Matthew writes, Early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. As Jesus stood before the governor, the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release for you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. And Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The rising crescendo of voices in the courtyard jarred me awake.
before my manservant ever rapped on my bedroom door. I figured something would happen. Something always happens in Jerusalem at Passover. There's so many people, so many visitors from the outlying provinces. There's always some kind of trouble when the city is bursting at its seams. I haven't been sleeping well for several nights now, ever since that big parade by the peasants over that prophet Jesus. When that Nazarene carpenter started upsetting tables in the temple, well, I knew there was going to be trouble. As I adjusted my toga and tightened my sandal straps, my servant informed me of the conditions for this meeting. It's bad enough I have to get up in the middle of the night to pacify the high priest and his cohorts, but because of the religious rules concerning defilement, I have to go out to them. They can't come into the judgment hall or they'll be contaminated somehow, unable to participate in their holy festival. So I, I, the Roman governor, have to kowtow to their demands. The prisoner was strangely silent. In spite of the accusations being screamed at him, he kept his peace. Questioning him was a near impossibility in this madhouse. I'd heard rumors about his teachings and his miracles. One of my servants heard that he had actually raised a man from the dead in a village nearby last week. I really really hope to have a chance to talk to this Jesus, maybe see one of his miracles. But he just stood there. He wasn't like the other men who stood before me, begging and pleading for their lives. It seems like the more guilty they are, the louder they beg. But this Jesus, he just stood there. Caiaphas and his cronies were screaming for justice. They wanted blood. So I offered to whip him a good 39 lashes with the cat of nine tails. That should do the job. But no, no, that wasn't good enough. They wanted this Jesus dead. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't pronounce a death sentence on an innocent man. So I had an idea. I had Barabbas brought up from the dungeon. I figured if they had a comparison, they would realize how unreasonable their demands were. I always made a, ha <clears throat> a habit of releasing one of the prisoners during their festivals, you know, sort of a goodwill gesture. And I thought if they saw the teacher, miracle worker, next to an insurrectionist murderer, well, surely they would choose Jesus. Which one do you want me to release for you, I said? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? I couldn't believe my ears. They wanted Barabbas. I knew the priests were jealous of the following that this prophet had generated, but this was insane. I asked them again, which one do you want? What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? The screams of the multitude almost knocked me off my seat. Crucify him. They had no charge against him deserving of death. They hadn't proved him guilty of anything. Why? What crime has he committed, I asked. And they screamed louder and louder. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. I was going to pardon him. I found no guilt in him. I told them so. I could release him. After all, I am the governor. 
appointed by Rome. My word is law. But in the midst of the uproar, my servant brought me a message from my wife. She said, don't have anything to do with that innocent man. I had a dream about him. I tried to make myself heard over the pandemonium in the courtyard, but the crowd was getting out of hand. Caiaphas and the elders had fanned the emotions of the crowd to a fever pitch. Palace guards were nervously fingering their swords and their spears, preparing for a riot. So I summoned my servant. I told him to bring me a basin of water and a towel. I might not be able to make myself heard, but I could make myself seen. As I dipped my hands in the water, the shouting subsided. My voice now rang out over the courtyard, I am innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. The response shocked me. Let his blood be on us and on our children, they shouted. I could have released Jesus of Nazareth. I told him so. Don't you realize I have the power to either release you or to crucify you? I had the power to save his life. But I abdicated that power. I turned it over to Caiaphas and his bloodthirsty crew. I washed my hands of the whole affair. I tried not to be involved. I said, I'm innocent. Why do I feel so guilty? For centuries, Pilate has been condemned as the no good heathen that sacrificed the Son of God in a torturous death on a cross. For eons, He's been maligned as a no-account, wishy-washy judge who pronounced a death sentence on Jesus, who was called Christ. Over the years, generation upon generation of those who claim allegiance to the Son of God has scorned the Roman governor as little more than a puppet of the Pharisees and the high priest. And yet Pilate, in my opinion, is not as guilty as he would appear. Indeed, if we carefully examine the scriptures, we find that he's not quite the scoundrel that we've been taught he was all these years. He really didn't want to sentence the Savior to be crucified. Indeed, Pilate thought Jesus was innocent. Three times, according to the four Gospels, he tried to release Jesus from custody. According to Luke's account, Pilate even pronounced a not guilty verdict. The 23rd chapter of Luke, Pilate says, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence. I find no basis for your charge against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But the mob, incited by the high priest's henchmen, would hear nothing of it. Certain that common sense would prevail, Pilate then decided to give the crowd a choice. Jesus, the miracle-working prophet, or Barabbas, the murderer and insurrectionist. Which one do you choose, he said. And the crowd shouted, 
for Barabbas. Unnerved by that cry, Pilate knew the answer to his question before he ever asked, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called to Christ? The unruly mob in the courtyard wanted blood. They would not be satisfied until somebody was dead. Pilate was at a spot because according to his own tradition, he was obligated now to release Barabbas. He was the crowd's choice. Jesus, the Nazarene carpenter turned prophet, would have to die. The crowd wanted crucifixion. Pilate's desire was freedom for this quiet captive, but fearful of his wife's dream. Frustrated by his inability to set the prisoner free, Pilate washed his hands of the case. Symbolically, he stood before the screaming mob and made a choice. By washing his hands, he chose not to be involved. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? When Pilate threw that question out to the captors and accusers, he threw it out to himself and to us as well. What will we do with Jesus, who is called Christ? In order to answer that question, in order to make an informed decision, we have to ask ourselves, as Pilate and Caiaphas and the others had to ask themselves, what do we believe about this Jesus? Who is he? What is he? Is he a troublemaker? A nobody who thinks he's somebody? Is he just a good man, a, a teacher, a prophet, a miracle worker, a nice guy? Or is he the Son of God, the Christ? Pilate had to face his own question. He had to decide what to do with Jesus. He tried to wash his hands of the whole affair. He tried to be uninvolved, to place the burden of guilt on Caiaphas and the bloodthirsty Jews. By washing his hands, by declaring, I am innocent, Pilate hoped to avoid answering his own question. And yet, by washing his hands, Pilate was making a decision. By not deciding, he was deciding. By refusing to cast his vote for Jesus' innocence, he was voting for his condemnation. We are very much like Pilate. Like him, we are confronted with the decision of what to do with Jesus. Like him, we have to decide if Jesus was who he claimed to be. Or was he a phony? A troublemaker who deserved to die. What will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? You can't wash his, your hands of him. Pilate couldn't. Not to decide is to decide. As Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. What will you do with Jesus, who is called to Christ? Let us pray. We really are not that much different than Pilate, O oh Lord. 
We struggle to decide for ourselves who Jesus really is. We're not sure. We need your wisdom, your guidance. We need to know for ourselves who Christ really is. We need to decide what we will do with the one called Jesus. Examine our hearts this day, O oh Lord, as we come to grips with Pilate's question, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? As you go throughout this week, consider Pilate's question as your question. Ask yourself honestly, what will I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And may the love and grace and forgiveness that Jesus purchased on Calvary. Guide and direct your day and your week. Go in his love and grace. Amen.